Hi, it's Miss Kyoto, ready for our shared reading. We're going to continue with Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. Yesterday, we finished our first trifold of activities, so you can take this trifold and put it into your reading and writing folder. Today, looking at our assignment on our slideshow that's in your student schedule, we see that we're gonna read chapters six through eight, six, seven, and eight. And so we're going to be doing the skills for those three chapters. Let's get another trifold. So in your packet of trifolds, you're gonna look for the one, um, the staple will be up on the right-hand side and you'll see it says chapters to read six and then seven to eight. These are the two different activities we're going to do today for those three chapters. So you need to tug this off of the packet and go ahead and fold it. We always want the picture to be on the outside, so I'm gonna fold this one in first and then go ahead and fold this over. Write your name and today's date for this trifold number two. And we'll use this as our bookmark until we do our next trifold. Today, as I said, we're gonna read chapters six, seven, and eight. And so we have these two activities to do. The first one is about word work, but it's really about becoming word wizards or building our vocabulary. So I want you to find words in this chapter that are interesting or unique. It doesn't mean words that you don't know, just it could be words that you don't know that are new to you, but it could also just be words that maybe you don't use that often and would like to build your vocabulary. So as you're reading, you can be listing some of these wonderful words. If you want to, as we're reading together, you can pause the video, write the word down and move on, or we could read the whole chapter then you pause the video and go back and look for interesting and unique words. Then for chapters seven and eight, we're going to think about the story so far and write a summary. We're gonna use the somebody want it, but so then structure. In these chapters, what was it that Wilbur wanted, but what got in his way? So what did he do? Then what happened? Also in this chapter, there's some bad news. So in this chapter, I want you to think about, oh, in chapter eight, what does what Wilbur wants, but what gets in his way? So what do you think is going to happen? How is the problem going to be solved? All right, let's get our trifolds put aside, get our book out, and now we're ready to read. Chapter six, Summer Days. The early summer days on a farm are the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with the lilacs and the bees visit around among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends and children have time to play and to fish for trouts in the brook. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr. Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning you could hear the rattle of the machine as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter bar in long green swaths. Next day there was no thunder shower. If there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake and pitch the, and load and the hay would be hauled to the barn in the high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding at the top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted, sweet and warm, into the big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of timothy and clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in, and sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. Early summer days are a jubilee time for birds. In the fields, around the house, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, 
everywhere love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, calls, oh, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. On the apple bough, the Phoebe teeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. If you enter the barn, the swallows swoop down from their nests and scold, cheeky, cheeky, they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk. Clover heads are loaded with nectar. The frigid air is full of ice cold drinks. Everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk, if you poke it apart, has a green worm inside it. And on the other side of the leaf of the potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bug. It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there sitting on her stool when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had, la had at last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming. She could hear their weak voices calling from inside the egg. She knew that they were in a desperately cramped position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quite still and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its gray green head through the goose's feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I, I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Locke had nothing to do with this, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. <coughs> Excuse me. At this point, Templeton showed his nose from his hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern, then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well liked, not trusted. Look! he began in his sharp voice. You say you have seven goslings. There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? It's a dud, I guess, said the goose. Oh, uh, what are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton, his little round beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to that nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his house. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton. If I ever catch you poking, oking, oking your ugly nose around our goslings, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the gander opened his strong wings and beat the air with them to show his power. He was strong and brave, but the truth is, both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton, and with good reason. The rat had no morals, no conscience, conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of rodent kindness, no compunctions, no higher feeling, no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he could get away with it. The goose knew that. Everybody knew that, knew it. With her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest. And the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Ugh, imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. 
A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling little laugh. But my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. What's that mean? asked Wilbur. It means nobody will be able to live here on account of the smell. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till he succeeded in rolling it to his lair under the trough. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose led her seven goslings off the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came with Wilbur's supper. Well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely? Chapter seven, bad news. Wilbur liked Charlotte better and better each day. Her campaign against insects seemed sensible and useful. Hardly anybody around the farm had a good word to say for a fly. Flies spent their time pestering others. The cows hated them, the horses detested them, the sheep loathed them, Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman were always complaining about them and putting up screens. Wilbur admired the way Charlotte managed. He was particularly glad that she always put her victim to sleep before eating it. It's real thoughtful of you to do that, Charlotte, he said. Yes, she replied in her sweet musical voice. I always give them an anesthetic so they won't feel the pain. It's a little service I throw in. As the days went by, Wilbur grew and grew. He ate three big meals a day. He spent long hours lying on his side, half asleep, dreaming pleasant dreams. He enjoyed good health and he gained a lot of weight. One afternoon, when Fern was sitting on her stool, the oldest sheep walked into the barn and stopped to pay a call on Wilbur. Hello, she said. Seems to me you're putting on weight. Yes, I guess I am, replied Wilbur. At my age, it's a good idea to keep gaining. Just the same, I don't envy you, said the old sheep. You know why they're fattening you up, don't you? No, said Wilbur. Well, I don't like to spread bad news, said the sheep. But they're fattening you up because they're going to kill you, that's why. They're going to what? screamed Wilbur. Fern grew rigid on her stool. Kill you. Turn you into smoked bacon and ham, continued the old sheep. Almost all young pigs get murdered by the farmer as soon as the real cold weather sets in. There's a regular conspiracy around here to kill you at Christmas time. Everybody is in the plot. Lurvy, Zuckerman, even John Arable. Mr. Arable? sobbed Wilbur. Fern's father? Certainly. When a pig is to be butchered, everybody helps. I'm an old sheep and I see the same thing, same old business year after year. Erbil arrives with his twenty-two, shoots the... Stop, screams Wilbur. I don't want to die. Save me, somebody. Save me. Fern was just about to jump up when a voice was heard. Be quiet, Wilbur, said Charlotte who had been listening to this awful conversation. I can't be quiet, screamed Wilbur, racing up and down. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to die. Is it true what the old sheep says, Charlotte? Is it true they are going to kill me when the cold weather comes? Well, said the spider, plucking thoughtfully at her web. The old sheep has been around this barn a long time, she has seen many a spring pig come and go. If she says they plan to kill you, I'm sure it's true. It's also the dirtiest trick I ever heard of. What people think of. Wilbur burst into tears. I don't want to die, he moaned. I want to stay alive right here in my comfortable manure pile with all my friends. I want to breathe the beautiful air and lie in the beautiful sun. You're certainly making a beautiful noise, snapped the old sheep. 
I don't want to die, screamed Wilbur, throwing himself to the ground. You shall not die, said Charlotte briskly. What? Really? cried Wilbur. Who's going to save me? I am, said Wil Charlotte. How? asked Wilbur. Well, that remains to be seen, but I am going to save you, and I want you to quiet down immediately. You're carrying on in a childish way. Stop your crying. I can't stand hysterics. Chapter 8. A Talk at Home. On Sunday morning, Mr. and Mrs. Arabelle and Fern were sitting at breakfast in the kitchen. Avery had finished and was upstairs looking for his slingshot. Did you know that Uncle Homer's gosling had hatched? asked Fern. How many? asked Mr. Arabelle. Seven, replied Fern. There were eight eggs, but one egg didn't hatch, and the goose told Templeton she didn't want it anymore, so he took it away. The goose did what? asked Mrs. Arabelle, gazing at her daughter with a queer, worried look. Told Templeton she didn't want the egg anymore, repeated Fern. Who is Templeton? asked Mrs. Arabelle. Oh, he's the rat, replied Fern. None of us like him much. Who's us? asked Mr. Arabelle. Oh, everybody in the cellar, in the barn cellar. Wilbur and the sheep and the lambs and the goose and the gander and the goslings and Charlotte and me. Sh Charlotte? said Mrs. Arabelle. Who's Charlotte? She's Wilbur's best friend. She's terribly clever. Uh, what does she look like? asked Mrs. Arabelle. Well, said Fern thoughtfully, she has eight legs. All spiders do, I guess. Charlotte is a spider, asked Fern's mother. Fern nodded. Uh-huh, a big gray one. She has a web across the top of Wilbur's doorway. She catches flies and sucks their blood. Wilbur adores her. Does he really, said Mrs. Arabel rather vaguely. She was staring at Fern with a worried expression on her face. Oh, yes, Wilbur adores Charlotte, said Fern. Do you know what Charlotte said when the goslings hatch? I haven't the faintest idea, said Mr. Arabel. Oh, I used the wrong voice. I haven't the faintest idea, said Mr. Arabel. Tell us. Well, when the first gosling st stuck its little head out from under the goose, I was sitting on my stool in the corner, and Charlotte was on her web. She made a speech. She said, I am sure that every one of us here in the barn cellar will be grateful to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of the goose, she now has something to show for her for it. <laughs> Don't you think that was a pleasant thing for her to say? Yes, I do, said Mrs. Arable. And now, Fern, it's time to get ready for Sunday school and tell Avery to get ready. And this afternoon, you can tell me more about what goes on in Uncle Homer's barn. Aren't you spending quite a lot of time there? You go there almost every afternoon, don't you? I like it there, replied Fern. She wiped her mouth and ran upstairs. After she had left the room, Mrs. Arable spoke in a low voice to her husband. I worry about Fern, she said. Did you hear the way she rambled on about the animals pretending that they talked? <laughs> Mr. Arable chuckled. Mm, maybe they do talk, he said. <clears throat> I've sometimes wondered. At any rate, don't worry about Fern. She's just got a lively imagination. Kids think they hear all sorts of things. Just the same, I do worry about her, replied Mrs. Arabelle. Hmm, I think I shall ask Dr. Dorian about her the next time I see him. He loves Fern almost as much as we do, and I want him to know how queerly she is acting about that pig and everything. I don't think it's normal. You know perfectly well animals don't talk. Mr. Arabelle grinned. Hmm, maybe our ears aren't as sharp as ferns, he said. Okay, so you have three, well, we read three chapters and you have three things to do. For chapter six, you're gonna write down the words. For chapter seven and eight, we have two summaries to do. The first one, at, for chapter seven, what Wilbur wanted, but what got in his way. So what did he do? Then what happened? And then for chapter eight, that's the bad news. And what does Wilbur want? But what's getting in his way? What's the trouble? And so what do you think is going to happen? What do you think will happen? All right. Stop and jot. That's all for now.
拜。